Hi, everybody. Good evening to you. I hope you had a great Tuesday. Already Tuesday. Today is April 16th, 2024. Day four of the Chad Daybell murder trial. And boy, oh boy, do we have a lot to talk about. There was a lot of testimony happening today. Some phone calls played. We had some text messages played, shown. We had emails shown and a blessing a religious blessing called a patriarchal blessing, which many of you are saying, what in the world is that? I'm going to try to explain it as best I can and play you part of that blessing that Chad Daybell gave to Alex Cox before Alex passed away. We're going to get into all that. I, I had a tough time, I'm going to admit to you, narrowing down what to talk about tonight because there was a lot in court today. Um, a lot of it we knew, I'll be honest with you. We heard it at Lori Vallow's trial last year, but still as eye-opening as ever. And if you've never heard of it before, you're thinking, whoa, what? This is, this is some crazy stuff. And then in the middle of all of it, a special hearing right after lunch outside of the presence of the jury about Rob Wood being called as a witness? John Pryor wanting to put Rob Wood on the stand? What was that about? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about that and so much more. Thank you for being here. I'm Nate Eaton. This is Courtroom Insider. Every night, breaking down the events of the Chad Daybell murder case live from Boise, been here every day of this trial and plan to continue to follow it through the very end. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions, our, our comment moderator, Peggy, is following every single word and every single comment. And she pulls all your questions and I'll get to as many as I can. If you have not subscribed, no, don't hit that button if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel. Uh, but there it is right there, East Idaho News. And I know many of you are um watching on our my meet in the eatons family channel so hello to those of you there and also to those of you on facebook tonight watching as well good to see you here okay so here is what we are going to talk about tonight there were three witnesses on the stand today one uh testified yesterday she was back there this morning and she kind of wrapped up her testimony got some questions in from john Pryor. then we heard from a detective from Arizona who was on the stand for quite some time today and he had a lot of stuff to say and then before we left for the day we had heard from a social security agent who takes care of the money we're going to talk money today emails and text messages as I mentioned Alex Cox's death we'll talk about that and your thoughts on the fact he died less than three weeks after getting that blessing from Chad Daybell wouldn't it be amazing if we could just figure out how Alex caught what happened with his death? I mean, we know that the medical examiner has released that it was natural causes due to a heart issue, but do you believe it? I mean, do you, I don't want to doubt the authorities and I'm not, but it just is so wild that the timing and all of it. The funeral home phone call, Mr. Daybell making a call to the funeral home. Coincidentally, ironically, on the day that Charles Vallow died, should say the day that Charles Vallow was shot and killed. The patriarchal blessing that I mentioned, we'll talk about the cash money, how much Lori was getting a month from her children's social security and her own social security. We're going to remember Tammy, JJ, Tylee, and Charles too. Tonight we have a, a wonderful photo of Charles. We'll talk about him. And of course, I want to answer your questions. So please submit those if you have them. Okay, so let me show you real quick before I jump to this. Here are the witnesses who testified today. You have on the screen left, Nicole Heidemann. I apologize, the photos are so bad for Nicole and Mark. It's just that we couldn't find any images of them elsewhere. Uh, Nicole Heidemann is an FBI tactical specialist. She really kind of put together the phone activity with uh, Chad Daybell before uh, in, in the midst of all this and and the phones associated to Lori Vallow and Alex Cox and and those three main parties and then we have Nathan Duncan he's with Chandler police he's a detective he was at the scene the day that Charles Vallow was shot and he has been since June of 2020 kind of the lead agent in that case his supervisor at the time was also named is also named Nathan Nathan Moffat uh, he got transferred to other assignments to another position. So Nathan Duncan kind of took over the 
the uh, case there in Arizona. And then Mark Sari. All three of these people did testify in Lori Vallow's trial, so they're no strangers. We've heard them before. Uh, Mark Sari is a social security special agent, and he knows a lot about uh, money when you get social security money and how much you get and the benefits and all that. So I have a little bit of, uh, from all of them to talk about tonight. Now, let me start with Nicole Heidemann. So she uh, presented basically the information she found by going through an email account associated to chad.daybell at gmail.com. She was flat out asked, can you 100% authenticate that all of these emails messages came from Chad. She can't. It was through his email address. It's like if my phone is here, I have children who sometimes will send messages that aren't from me, but they appear to be from me. They're not. And so she made it clear that, um, you know, these messages, they couldn't a hundred percent sure say, yes, it was Chad Daybell who sent it. But man, there's a lot of smoke around that fire or fire around that smoke, I should say. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the Chad Daybell searches associated to this email account. Again, I can't 100 percent say that these were Chad doing these searches, but you, you decide you read the data, you decide. OK, so these are just some of the ones that I pulled. The first one uh, before we get here, I just want to set the timeline really quick. This is the first email was January of 2019. Lori and Chad met the, previ the, the previous summer. Okay, so they've known each other for a while. Octo or, uh, January 28th of 2019. Chad Daybell searches for Ned Snyder. He searches for Ned Snyder obituary, Louisiana, 1987. And then he searched for bodies possessed after original occupant dies. So this belief, this teaching, this doctrine about spirits possessing bodies and whatnot be began at least if this was the earliest indication of it january of 2019 so this is a full year before chad and lawyer are in hawaii even less than that uh before that he also searched for ned schneider louisiana obituary 1997 so we have the variation of ned either schneider or snyder it appeared to kind of go back and forth we've got a search on march 6th of 2019 star sign are cancer and leo compatible taurus and leo compatible those of course are the astrological signs that all of us have based on when we're born he was researching Lori's sign his sign and tammy's sign seeing if they were compatible with each other. On the 5th of the 5th of 19, May 5th, he searched Malachite. Why does that matter? Well, look at this search later on. We'll get to the Malachite in a minute. On June 1st, he searched Hiplos. Hiplos was the name that they gave to Charles Vallow, and so was Ned Schneider. Okay, remember... There were these spirits before they were zombies, or maybe they were already zombies that on the dark chart, there was Ned Schneider slash Snyder, who they said had possessed Charles Vallow's body. Then Ned went away and it was Hiplos. So they were able to get Ned out of his body, but then Hiplos came to go inside the body. So he searched for that name on June 1st of 2019. On the 9th of July of 2019, that is the day Charles Vallow is shot and killed. And someone from the Chad Daybell email account searched when you surprise someone with accusations. Interesting. And then on the day before, police believe J.J. Vallow was buried on Chad's property Someone associated to his email account searched wind directions, south, southwest. It was more detailed than just wind directions, but it was south, southwest, wind directions, uh, what, you know, whatnot, what was happening with the wind and the direction that particular day. And the next day, police say, I'm sorry, that well, I said JJ, I meant Tylee. The next day, Tylee. That's when they, they believe Tylee was buried on uh, September the 9th. And then the last search that they focused on was from the 8th of October, a, a month later. Remember, JJ at this point was, was dead. Charles was dead. Tammy was not quite dead. This was the day before that paintball gun 
alleged episode in the driveway, he was searching for a Rhode Island area code. Some of you might be thinking, a Rhode Island area code? What? Why that? Like, why? That doesn't fit in with all of this list. Well, Chad Daybell had a bunch of track phones, burner phones, as they're sometimes called. And those phones, one of them had a Rhode Island area code. And calls were made and text messages were sent from that Rhode Island phone number. So he Googled what the Rhode Island area code would be. I don't know. I don't know if we ever know or we ever found out why Rhode Island. Why not Virginia, Ohio? I don't know why it was Rhode Island, but that's what it is. Okay, so uh, Nicole Heidemann went through the Chad Daybell email searches, the chad.daybell at gmail.com. Then... She went through the Lolly Time email accounts. Lori Vallow had two emails, Lori for Style and Lolly Time. And she did, she showed us some of the searches. By the way, she went into, as, as with the case every night, she went into far more detail than I am tonight. If you want to go in and, and go and actually listen to everything she said, I'm just kind of giving you a, a highlight reel of, of what she had to say and the other witnesses. But here is the email searches for Lori Vallow. Five seven, Malachite. Seven twenty one, before JJ and Tylee are killed, but after Charles Vallow dies, she searched a Gerber life policy, and insurance for children. So she was searching for life insurance policies for kids. Uh, Nicole Heidemann testified today that there was no proof or evidence that Lori actually ever got a policy for her children, but. She did do some research, or as I should say, someone associated with the Lolly Time account. A few days later, she started to do searches about the service dog. Remember, JJ had a service dog that was trained to help him with his autism and other special needs, and she basically sold the dog, or she was looking for ways to sell the dog to get rid of the dog. A month later, on the 25th, wedding bands made of malachite. So, so she starts looking for the Malachite search in May, as did Chad Daybell. I believe his was, his was May 5th. Um, let me double check on that. Yeah, his was May 5th. So he's looking at May 5th. She's looking at May 7th. Coincidental timing there. Both of their spouses are still alive. Uh, but not on August 25th, when she searches for wedding bands made of Malachite. And then in... September of 2019, remember they moved to Rexburg the beginning of September and on the 20th, that was just days before they believe JJ died, she searched for Kennedy Elementary, the phone number and I believe the address and then also searched for define possesses. Remember, this is around the time where they said he was possessed of a zombie. This is the same weekend Melanie Gibb and David Warwick are staying at Lori's house. But then on the 24th, after JJ is dead and buried in Chad Daybell's backyard, she again searches for the Kennedy Elementary phone number. So she was doing research before he died, and then likely after he died is when she notified the school that he wouldn't be coming back. She told him she'd be homeschooling him. On the 30th, she searched, or someone associated with the email, how to get your back seat out of a Jeep. DIY YouTube videos. Do it yourself. This is the Jeep that Tylee was driving that belonged to Charles Vallow that was used when Brandon Boudreaux was shot just days later. Shot at, I should say, not shot, in Arizona. The Jeep went from Rexburg to Arizona and somebody was searching for how to remove that back seat. You may recall the tire, the spare tire that's on the back of a Jeep also was taken off and put in that storage unit. We've got the video showing it being rolled in and out. And uh, one would think, well, you can take out the back seat and remove that tire and have a pretty clear shot if you should shoot out of the back. There was testimony last year at Lori Vallow's trial about that very issue. And I imagine we'll hear it today. Then on the day that the shooting occurs in Arizona, someone, Lori, Googles Gilbert, Arizona News. Probably wanted to see if it made the news that Brandon Boudreaux, her former nephew, was shot at on his way home from the gym. I don't know if it ever made the news, by the way, that day at least. Now it's in the news. 
the 22nd, three days after Tammy Daybell dies, wedding dresses, wedding dresses in Kauai. So you've got all these email searches. You know, even if you clear your history, they can find it. And I don't know if Chad and Lori cleared their history, but never assume that it cannot be found. So they go through all of these emails. They talk about JJ's death, Tylee's death, got into a little bit of Charles's death. And then it's John Pryor's turn to cross-examine Miss Heideman. And I want to play a clip of that, of what he asked her and her responses. So this was John Pryor cross-examining Nicole Heideman. And at the time, are you aware of the four people who were around J.J. Vallow at that specific time? Uh, the four, what four people? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, that's what I'm going to, I'm trying to get to. You, you, you're aware that J.J. Vallow was allegedly murdered either in uh, an apartment of Lori Vallow's or a close proximity to that. You agree with that, right? I don't know that we know exactly where he was killed, no. Okay. But you do know that J.J. Vallow was, um, was being watched by Alex Cox that day and that evening of the 22nd, correct? Uh, partially, yes. Okay. And you know that Melanie Gibb was there on the evening of the 22nd at Lori Vallow's apartment, correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. And you know that David Warwick was there on the 22nd on the evening of the day or the day that J.J. Vallow was murdered, right? Yes. Okay. And so we have Lori Vallow, correct, correct. on that day? Yes. Alex Cox on that day, correct? Correct. Melanie Gibb on that day, correct? Correct. David Warwick on that day, correct? Correct. So I'm, I'm having some difficulty with you bringing up these Google searches. And this is why I'm having some difficulty is you're talking today about searching these peoples and, and talking about events. And we'll get to these events in a minute. I don't see any Google searches on Melanie Gibb or David Warwick. And why is that? Your Honor, I'm going to object as argumentative. Overruled. Why don't I have any Google search information on Melanie Gibb or David Warwick? I'm not aware if I... I don't know off the top of my head if any legal process was served on those individuals or not. Well, and, and this is what I'm having some difficulty with. This is what I'm struggling with. Your Honor, objection to the narrative if he wants to ask a question. I'll sustain that. Just okay. questions, Mr. Pryor. Okay. Well, if David Warwick and Melanie Gibb were present for the murder of J.J. Vallow, why aren't we looking into their Google searches? I, I don't actually write the search warrant, sir, so I, okay. I'm not sure if they were who would have done that. Okay. But it's common knowledge that they were at least there, right? For a partial time, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So interesting point there that why didn't the police look at Melanie's searches or David's searches? And believe me. When those two take the stand, they better buckle in because I don't think Pryor is going to go gentle as he has suggested all along. He has a lot of questions for Melanie Gibb. So, you know, again, his job is to defend his client and try to poke holes in the, the side of the prosecutors. And he did that today by saying, well, their searches were never looked at. Uh, and maybe if the police had searched their their computers and whatnot, there would have been nothing, um, probably. I don't know. I actually don't know. But clearly there's stuff here for Chad and Lori. So uh, Nicole Heidman, Heidman, she finished her testimony after that. And then we have Detective Nathan Duncan. Now, uh, Nathan Duncan has played a pivotal role in all of this from the beginning. He was one of the first detectives on the scene after Charles Vallow was shot on July 19th. He went through the house. He talked to Alex. He noticed that after uh, the body of Charles was turned over, there was a bullet like lodged in the floor, meaning it appeared that Charles Vallow was shot the second time when he was already down. 
he noticed that there was not a lot of blood, even though Alex Cox had said he gave CPR. And normally if someone has been shot and you're giving CPR, there's a lot of blood involved and there was not, according to the detective. Uh, he noticed a lot of stuff around there. So he talked about that. And then he talked about emails between Chad, Charles, Lori, Tammy, to a point, emails that were sent to Tammy, but to this day, we don't know if she received those emails, and they'd say that they don't know. Uh, but I want to kick it off with the, one of the first ones he read. This was an email sent to Chad, uh, but listen to it. Listen to it and see if you really think it was from Charles Vallow or somebody else. Hello, Chad. I hope you are doing well. This is Charles Vallow from Arizona. We really enjoyed having you stay with us back in November when you came to the Preparing a People conference. I appreciated you taking the time to talk to me about the book I've been working on. Well, more than six months later, I still haven't made much progress on it, but I feel an urgency to get it done. As the managing partner of Wright Planning Group, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak at various conventions beginning in the fall. But everyone says I need to have a book available that summarized my life and shares the principles I follow. So I will cut to the chase. I'm willing to pay you well to help me get this book into shape as my ghostwriter. I really liked your autobiography and the tone you took in sharing experiences without preaching. Is there any way you could come here for a couple of days and help me get the book underway? I feel talking in person would be much more valuable than a phone call or video chat, mainly because I would like you to read through some of my journals and explain to me how the publishing industry works. It would help me know whether I truly have a book in me and whether you want to team up on it. I played minor league baseball and have plenty of stories that my audience could relate to, along with the knowledge I've gained running my own company. So I do feel the book would contain valuable information even beyond the convention circuit. I'm out of town until Sunday, but I would gladly fly you down here next week before the holiday and cover your expenses. You could stay in our guest room like before or in a hotel if you prefer. I hate to take you away from your family, but I know this book is vital to, to my speaking success. I understand if you don't want to take part in the project, but I would definitely make it worth your time. With admiration, Charles. Okay, so Charles didn't send that email, but Charles found the email on Lori's computer, and he, of course, was quite disturbed by it. This was how he responded. Uh, I'll play you some text that he sent to Lori, and then back and forth, and you can kind of follow what Detective Duncan says. Yeah, so these are messages that were found on Charles Vallow's phone extractions. Uh, the first message is from Charles to Lori, dated uh, June 29, 2019 at 5.51 a.m. Is he with whom you're having an affair? He did not stay with us in Arizona in November. Who are you lying to now? Trying to destroy another family? You're evil, period. I may take JJ back to Houston unless you have a great explanation for all of this. I will not let him be a party to your apostasy. The next message from Charles to Lori, June 29, 2019 at 6.04 a.m. Just so you know, I have Tammy, Chad's wife, or Chad's wife email address. I will send a copy of my email you sent to KK Walker. Tammy will know what you're up to. You better explain. Charles then writes... June 29, 2019 at 6.10 a.m. I now have Tammy Daybell's cell number. I'll text her a copy of the letter and an explanation of what you're up to. You have till noon your time to explain or I'm sending via text and email to her. And finally, Charles to, Laura, to Lori on June 29th at 6.55 a.m. I'm sure you're up by now. You have until 10 a.m. your time to respond or I send the emails and texts to Tammy. And at the time these emails are being exchanged, Charles is still alive, obviously. Yes, he is. And Tammy Daybell is still alive. Yes. 
And you had recovered that previous email that we talked about. Correct. And that email appears to have been written by someone holding themselves out to be Charles to Chad Daybell. Correct. Through your investigation, did you learn whether or not Charles actually made contact or attempted to make contact with Tammy? I did, yes. And what did you learn in relation to that? So again, looking at Charles' phone, there is indication that Charles had um, addressed emails to uh, Tammy Daybell and sent those emails to her. Do you know or did you learn whether or not Tammy ever looked at those or received them? Uh, there's no indication that she looked at them or received them. And looking to the next slide. Once again, uh, Charles to Lori, June 29th, 1223 p.m. Just so you know, and Chad know, I am going to talk to Tammy in person if I have to. I've already emailed and texted her. Your game is up. Charles sends another message to Lori the same day at 5.04 p.m. Please stop spending money on the credit cards. I appreciate it. Yeah. He's just trying to figure out what's happening and why. I mean, he he's figured this out and he even reaches out to Tammy. That was in June, I believe. And I, I do wonder if because it was the summer uh, break, if Tammy wasn't working at the school and didn't get the email or maybe, I mean, you think about it if you're in her shoes and she, if she truly did have no idea. If you get an email like that, what are you going to think? Like, who's this crazy guy saying this? Um, but maybe she didn't even get it. Maybe it just went straight to spam or who knows? There's no indication that she got it. Maybe she got it and just didn't read it or, or got it, read it and just didn't want to deal with it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But I've spoken with her family members who her extended family, siblings and whatnot. And they say that she, everything was fine. She never said anything. Anything was wrong leading up to this. So Charles contacts contacts Tammy. Lori goes back and forth with him. You can go through and play all the texts yourself if you want. Um, and basically says, she's not going to talk to you. She's my friend. Leave it alone. Are you coming on the 4th of July? Whatever. This is a month before he shot and killed. So there's probably, there might already be plans in the works that something is going to come down the line for Charles. Well, Eventually, texts are shown, and Detective Duncan testifies that Lori was in Hawaii when uh, Charles or when Tammy died that October. One of her friends texts and says to Tammy, says to Lori, "Oh my gosh, I heard. I'm paraphrasing here. I heard about uh, Ch Chad's wife died." And Lori says, "What? I haven't heard. I'm in Hawaii at 6:30." And then she says, yeah, she, she died this morning. You know what happened? And right away, Ta Lori responds, she woke up coughing, she vomited, she passed out and died. <laughs> In the series of four minutes, it's like Lori at first didn't know what happened and then suddenly was able to find out what happened and tell her friend within four minutes. Well, then a few hours later, a few hours later, Melanie Gibb texts and says, I heard about Tammy. And Lori says, what? What are you talking about? Like she hadn't heard. Interesting. Those were played in court. Then we get some messages about money, 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 money. And it's uh, what Lori was texting to Chad after Charles died. Remember, Charles had a million dollar life insurance policy. Remember how Lori was the beneficiary until March of 2019 when he was worried that Lori might do something or that something might be up, he changed the beneficiary to Kay Woodcock. But Lori didn't know that. He, Charles didn't tell Lori. A few days after Tammy died, a few days after Charles died, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's been a, been a long day in court, um, she called to get the money, and the money wasn't for her. It was for someone else. And so she was upset. She had to break the news to her boyfriend. Chad, this is what she said. Can you tell us what we're seeing here and read it into the record? So this is another message uh, on the Lori, uh, Lolly time, I believe. Lori, uh, Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell, 718, 
2019 at 12, 19 hours. Lori says, so I talked to the insurance company. He changed it in March. So it was probably Ned before we got rid of him. They can't tell me to who, of course, but it's done. I still get the 4,000 a month from SS. Did you learn through your investigation what the SS stood for? Yes. And what was that? Social security. And did you learn through the investigation whether or not Lori was getting Social Security money or if her kids were? Yes, she was. Yes. And looking at this next one, can you tell us what we're seeing here and read it into the record? It was a message from Chad to Lori on 7-26-2019 at 8.13 p.m. Tonight I figured out who I feel like. I'm a grown-up version of Harry Potter who has to live with the Dudleys in his little space under the stairs. Every few weeks, I get to escape and have an amazing adventures with my goddess lover. But then I have to return to my place under the stairs, feeling trapped. But I sense permanent freedom is coming. I had to pause on that one a minute. For those of you that haven't heard that message before, the Harry Potter quote I was seated next to Tiffany from Court TV during this part of today, and she looks at me like, what? <laughs> Harry Potter? I'll read, I'll read it to you again. Tonight, and this was 7-26-2019. I know, I, I know it's kind of humorous, but if you think about it, Tammy Daybell is still alive. And... Tammy Daybell will be alive for another three months. And Charles Vallow has just been killed. And so Chad is texting. Tonight I figured out who I feel like. I Tonight I figured out who I feel like. I'm, I'm a grown-up version of Harry Potter who has to live with the Dudleys in his little space under the stairs. Every few weeks I get to escape and have amazing adventures with my goddess lover. But then I have to return to my place under the stairs, feeling trapped. But I sense permanent freedom is coming. What are your thoughts when you hear that? Comment. I'd love to read through those thoughts because I'm sure it's just, you know, sometimes it's hard to explain. And I said, just, I told, I told her and I tell you tonight, just wait till the romance novel between James and Elena comes into play because that you think the Harry Potter quote is out of this world. Just wait for that. And I imagine it will be. If you haven't read that, we, we have it on our website. So there, then there, then is there's messages about evil spirits, about Hiplos. There's talk about Zulema texting Lori about them getting rid of evil spirits, getting rid of Hiplos, which is the evil spirit that incorporated Charles's body uh, that'll come more into play when Zulema takes the stand, I imagine. There's an email, allegedly, from a youth leader in Texas where Lori was living at the time asking Char a Chad to come down there and speak at a conference for the youth. And he'd be the main speaker and they'd pay for his lodging and they'd pay for his, his flight and they'd give him food. And this youth leader said that she had a, her own little cottage there that he could stay in. Uh, Detective Duncan was unsure if Chad ever went down to Texas to speak at that conference, but I could just imagine if he gets this email and runs into his wife and says, hey, honey, look, they're inviting me to Texas. What a, what a great opportunity to go and promote my books. And Tammy being like, yeah, that's great. Go do it. I don't know if that's what happened, but I can, I can, I can see it. Um, then we get into the Valley of the Sun funeral home call. This, again, was played last year at Lori Vallow's trial. The audio was not as clear last year. We have a clear copy today. This call was made the night that Charles Vallow died. And listen to the call. I'm sure Chad Daybell had no clue that the call was recorded and that the funeral home kept it for so long. Um, it's pretty impressive. I, I honestly wouldn't think me calling a funeral home that they would keep the call for so long. But but listen to what he asked, his request, the the lies he told 
and the information he was trying to get. Third ring answer. In our home. Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm assisting them with their calls. How can I help you today? Um, we just had a death in the family, and we really don't want anything but a cremation and then to send the tree names to a family in Louisiana. Just a simple, no, nothing other than a cremation and sending him to the family for a service in Louisiana. So is, is there any way to know a ballpark price on that? Yes, and I'm sorry for your loss. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Let me transfer you over to the director who can assist you with the pricing. Uh, what is your name, please? It is Chad Daybell. How do you spell the last name, please? D-A-B-A-L, Daybell. How are you related to the person who passed? I'm his nephew. And then also, this is for the Valley of the Sons in Chandler, correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, he lives there in Chandler. I live in Iowa, so I'm just oh. trying to help out. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Yes, um, what is um, your uncle's name for reference, please? He is John Dayball. And last name? Well, yeah. D-A-B-A-L. Okay. The same. John uh -huh. Do you have a middle name? Myron. M Y R O N. Yeah. And Chad, what is your phone number in case we get disconnected? Yeah. This number five one five. I don't actually know my own number. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me look real quick. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Five one five four zero two zero one four three. Thank you. Is he at a nursing home, hospital, or residence? He passed away in a hospital. I don't know the details. Okay. It, <laughs> yeah, it's just for um, to know because sometimes it's different if it's a residential or hospital oh. or a nursing home. Okay. Thinking they're sending him to the medical examiner. I'm not sure. I should have had more information before I called. I'm oh, sorry. That's okay. All right. Cremation with shipping to which um which which city? New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Okay, one moment, please, uh, Chad, stay on the line. Let me uh, transfer you over to the director who can assist you with that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chad. Yeah. Thank you for holding. I do have the director, Carissa, on the line to further assist you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, so my name is Carissa. I'm a female director with Polly Assistant Mushroom Cemetery. I understand that your uncle passed away. Yes, and I, and I'm, I'm just starting the process for the family. He didn't have many relatives. I'm his nephew. I live in Iowa. Um, but what so they want to hear do that. is, it's yeah, sad to see him go. You know, I think he's going to the medical examiner. I don't know all the details, but. What the family basically wants is just to have him cremated there in Chandler and then shipped, have its cremated shipped to New Orleans. Okay. And we'll deal with the service later. <laughs> so just trying to get a ballpark price. Okay. Um, so for a cremation, um, we are able to do our cremation for $1,000. $695. Now, what that's going to include is the transportation into our care, the transportation to and from our crematory, our basic mm -hmm. professional fees, as well as our um, crematory fee, 
Now there's going to be a couple other charges there for you. Um, okay. So we are going to have um, death certificates, which are 20 away from peace with a processing fee. Okay. $15 permit fee. All right. And then we're able to do that transfer um, through the mail for you, and that's $150 fee for you. Okay. You mean like okay. through EPS or something, I guess? <laughs> okay. So close about a 2000 probably, kind of a ballpark, I guess. Close to, yeah. Okay. Well, that helps me a lot. I, I'm going to call one or two others, but I'll get back to you if we come that direction. Thank you so much. Oh. You're welcome. If you need anything, I'll give you a call. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's, that's the end of the call. DeBell, Chad DeBell, DeBell, Myron, middle name for the uncle, made the night that Charles Vallow was shot. Okay. So then we went to lunch. We came back. There was a hearing about Rob Wood being called as a witness. Now, um, the jury was not there for this. And how this came about is yesterday or the day before, yesterday, because yesterday was Monday, the prosecution filed a motion in limine, meaning like in process, like right now, that they were worried that John Pryor was setting up the trial to have Rob Wood called as a witness. And that is highly, highly unusual and really only happens if a prosecutor witnesses a crime or if the prosecutor can witness if the prosecutor can witness to something that maybe a witness did and that witness can no longer testify you never see a prosecutor take the stand in, in their own case and if that were to happen and any little thing went wrong it could result in a mistrial so Lindsay Blake filed this kind of emergency motion. She asked that it be sealed, but Judge Boyce today before lunch said there's no reason to seal it. We already have a jury. This is already going. The companion case, Lori Vallow's case, is done, so I'm not going to seal it. We'll talk about it after lunch. We went to lunch. We came back. The jurors were not in the courtroom. And basically, Lindsay Blake said, I... Rob Wood should not be called as a witness in this case. We're worried he's going to be. John Pryor responded and said, I have no intention in calling Rob Wood, but Melanie Gibb and Rob Wood had 342 emails and texts with each other over the course of six months during the course of the investigation. And I think I'm going to admit those texts. Then he said, well, if Melanie Gibb does not recall the texts and the emails, I'm going to ask to have them admitted. And you can see how the prosecutor would be worried because if Melanie Gibb doesn't recall the texts or can't authenticate that they actually came from Rob Wood, well, who would they call on to authenticate them? Rob Wood. But they don't, Rob Wood can't get called. It makes it really messy. Pryor repeatedly said, I have no intention of calling Rob Wood. Apparently, he subpoenaed Rob Wood, and Judge Boyce squat, uh, quashed the subpoena. So Boyce made it clear, Rob Wood will not be called to the witness stand in this trial. Then the prosecutor asked if the exhibit that John Pryor has with those emails could be tossed out. Pryor said he, he's not going to rule on that now, but he will pay attention to the questioning of Melanie Gibb. They also asked if Judge Boyce would, I guess, give direction or more further narrow the line of questioning for John Pryor. And the judge said, "I, no, I'm not going to do that. So basically, Wood's not going to get called to testify. But Melanie Gibb, it sounds like she's going to be asked about these emails with Rob Wood. Again, Melanie Gibb has to buckle up because that's going to be quite the day of testimony. So that lasted about... And by the way, those emails and texts, uh, the judge mentioned it to the prosecutor. It is it is common for a prosecutor to get with a witness to talk about their testimony. They obviously cannot tell them what to say or coach them on. Be sure you say this. I mean, but but they 
that happens. That happens. There is, you know, they work with them and sometimes witnesses are scared or they, they don't know what to say or they, they need guidance and direction. And that's kind of what the prosecutor does. So that's not unusual, much like the defense could get with their witnesses and say, OK, here's, you know, this, this and this. Um, so I, I don't know how damning it is that Rob Wood texted her a, a lot. Three hundred and forty two times, they say. Um, all right. The patriarchal blessing. This was eye-opening and I could say shocking for many people. I'm going to explain this as best I can. So in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS, sometimes called Mormon, the, the areas are divided up into wards. You worship every Sunday with your ward, and it's done by a boundary, a geographical boundary. The wards then make up a steak, S-T-A-K-E, not like a steak, what you had for dinner. That sounds good. But a steak. So a steak could have 10 or 12 or 5 wards. Each steak has a position called a patriarch. This is somebody who is called on to give special blessings to the members of the stake. And when I say special blessings, it's a blessing that you would get once in your lifetime. And it kind of is, gives you guidance and direction on how to live your life. And everyone's different. And most youth in the LDS faith would get it around their youth years. Maybe a guy or a girl before they go on a mission or when they're in high school. Um, and like I said, you get, you get the one, it's yours, and it's typed out after you get it, and you keep it through your life. Most people refer to it a lot. So that's what a patriarchal blessing is. You can Google it and go to the LDS Church's website and read about it if you want more info, but that's kind of a base level. Well, Chad Daybell, gave Alex Cox a patriarchal blessing from the Church of the Firstborn, not the LDS Church. One, Chad Daybell was not authorized on behalf of the LDS Church to give a blessing like that. Um, but two, this Church of the Firstborn, it sounds like this was Chad's church. So I did a little Googling. This is what came up. Um... um the General Assembly and the Church of the Firstborn is a Christian church. This group is not an offshoot of the Latter-day Saints. This group has no affiliation with Mormon fundamentalist groups with similar firstborn names. So there is Church of the Firstborn, and then there is a Church of the Firstborn, one word, which as a sect of the Latter-day Saint movement formed as an offshoot of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1861 and was involved in the Morisite War. Its adherents are known as Morisites and schismatic sects have been defunct since 1969, accepting the Order of Enoch. I don't know what that means, to be honest with you, other than it sounds like this church uh, is mentioned, according to John Pryor, in the Doctrine and Covenants, a, a, a book of scripture for the Latter-day Saints. But um, Chad was apparently bringing it back, <laughs> the Church of the Firstborn back. And as part of that, yes. he was bringing back patriarchal blessings. Can you tell us what we're seeing Oops. here and read it into the record? Um, so this was a blessing giving given to Alex Cox on... November 24th, 2019. That was a Sunday. And that was, um, I need to see, because he got married over Thanksgiving weekend of that year. Thanksgiving was on, oh, my calendar doesn't say, the 28th. So Thanksgiving was a few days later and he got married in Vegas to Zulema. So he got the blessing on the 24th, then he gets married to Zulema, and then less than three weeks later, he's dead. And if you listen to this blessing, Chad tells him 
that basically his work is done. I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's it's long. We just posted it on our website, but I or on our our YouTube. You can listen to the whole thing, but I want you to listen to some of it. Chad Daybell, it is November 24th, 2019, Sunday afternoon, 5:15 p.m. We are going to give Alex Lamar Cox a patriarchal blessing. Alexander Lamar. Mm -hmm. You can hear Lori is there with them. Alexander Lamar Cox. On this special day, I lay my hands upon your head to give you a patriarchal blessing. As part of a mem the member of the Church of the Firstborn, that you have earned the privilege to be a member of. I do so by the power of the Melchizedek priesthood, which I hold, and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has authorized this blessing. It is grateful that you are receiving it as you move forward in your life. You are a member of the House of Israel, of the 12 tribes, and you are a descendant of Joseph through the tribe of Ephraim, which grants you many blessings, particularly of spreading the gospel in these latter days and, and protecting and preserving those who seek to learn the truth. And that has been your mission on this earth and it will now expand into ways that we will discuss further in the blessing. I want to begin by opening up the portals of time and going back to your previous creations in which you've lived. I see you on the third creation as a valiant warrior fighting for truth and righteousness, always seeking to do what is right. Then you progressed and were selected by the Savior himself to be part of the fourth creation. Great warriors were needed in that creation. Powerful goddesses were needed to be protected and you were selected to help protect your sister, and you helped her in numerous probations as a defender. You have a special bond even from the pre-mortal world. You connected there, and as she grew in power, you were right there beside her always. With a humble heart. You both always were so humble. Okay, so there again, I it is it is a long blessing. That was maybe a quarter of it. Um, it is newsworthy because and I mean, the reason you know I'm talking about it is because it was played at the trial. I realized it's uncomfortable for many to listen to, but he basically tells him that he's been a warrior for his sister, he fought for his sister, and that um, eventually the day will come where he will be joined with his, with, with Jesus Christ. And again, he dies three weeks later. So the timing is just, uh, I don't know, coincidental. What, what do you want to call it? Um, so that is, that, that was, took up a big chunk of the afternoon. I want to get through a couple of other things really quick about, um, Alex and then we got to a really interesting part where um, John Pryor questions the detective, Nathan Duncan, about the statute, well, about Charles Vallow, and asks specifically if Chad Dable has been charged in connection with that case in Arizona. And he hasn't. We know he hasn't. But listen to what the the we'll listen to what we glean out of this back and forth between Pryor and Duncan about the um, charges down in Arizona. Reasons stated 
in this document as to why they would not prosecute Chad Daybell in the in the uh, Charles Vallow case? Yes. Can you tell me what that reason is? The reason they provided was no reasonable likelihood of conviction. So I'm going to repeat that and then make sure I said that and heard you correctly. At my age, I don't always hear clearly. No reasonable likelihood of conviction. Is that what it says? Yes. And to your knowledge, they're not pursuing this in any other way in the future against Chad Daybell. Is that correct? Uh, that is never taken off the table. No. Okay. But at this point, you don't have an active investigation against Chad Daybell, do you? I There are records that I would like to look at that other agencies have. But like I said, there's no statute of limitations uh, right. on the side. So oh, yeah, there's I could always, statu I'm sorry. Yeah, I could always uh, look at additional records. And if additional evidence came forward, then it could be charged. But based on the evidence that you presented and the evidence you presented today, that was all provided to the prosecuting attorney, right? And this is based on evidence as of 2021, yes. Right. So it's all, they have all the current evidence, right? I'm not sure if they have other jurisdictions evidence. Okay. Uh, they clearly have ours. Okay. Did you catch that? It's not completely off the table. Uh, if uh, It's not closed, they could say. So if some other evidence com comes forward, there's no statute of limitations. For murder, wouldn't that be wild if Chad Daybell ends up getting a getting another murder charge in Arizona? We'll be having courtroom insider in five years again. Same case. We'll all be five years older. That I thought was interesting. Um, then our last witness of today was Mark Sorry. He's a Social Security special agent, and he talked about how much money Tylee and JJ were getting along with Lori. And here's the breakdown. Every month, because of T Tylee was getting $1,859 since Joseph Ryan, her father, passed away. Then JJ, after Charles died, was getting $1,951. And Lori was getting $1,951 because she was the spouse of Charles when he died. And the total was $5,761 a month. So nearly 6000 bucks a month. I did do some research on if this is tax-free. I, I, I found some conflicting information. It sounds like the majority of it is tax-free. Um, but again, I know that some of you out there are experts and you would know if you would have to pay tax on this. So I'm just going to do the math here. 5761 that's an annual salary. I say salary. I should say $69,000 a year from social security benefits. They did note that when Tylee turned 18, that would be cut off and she was killed months before her 18th birthday. Uh, she died in September. Well, both of the children died in September and the social security cut it off in January when the children were reported missing or actually when there was no sign of them, they had been reported missing a few weeks prior. The interesting thing is that, um, Mark Sari testified that if you are on Social Security and a life event happens, you have to legally notify them. If you get married, if, you, if, you're, if your loved one dies, if you move, if you have a baby, all of those things, you have to notify them. They were never notified. John Pryor asked Mark Sari, he said, well, this all points to Lori. There's no mention of Chad here at all in any of this money. And Mark Sari said, you're right. And John Pryor said, well, then... Would it have been his job to notify you? And Mark Sari said, actually, I think legally, if you know you're with someone that's getting Social Security and you know that there's wrongdoing, you do have to notify. So that is how the day ended. I told you there was a lot. And I felt like we got to 10%. We could talk all night, but then we'd be tired of each other. Um, so that the, the question I have for you now, at the end of all of today is that the question that just will keep me up tonight is how did Alex Cox die? I know he died and it was natural causes. I know, I know that they said that they don't have any more evidence. He was cremated. So it's not like he can be exhumed to do another test, but the ME did a thorough exam, died of a heart condition, but man, there were so many coincidental things. The blessing and then the fact that he told Zulema, Zulema will probably testify to this, that he had money upstairs and everything happened to him. Here's where it was at. And then he died the next day. It's just so 
coincidental or just completely ironic. Um, all right. So go listen to all the testimony, read through the notes. If you're interested, a full day expected tomorrow. I'm going to get through some of your questions and shout outs really quick. I have to shout out Janice. She brought full size mega smarties today to the courthouse. And, and you know, what's funny. I told you all last year that I love smarties and you guys sent smarties, including Canadian smarties. I honestly haven't had a lot of smarties since a year ago. And I've been craving them lately. So today during lunch, I walked over to the grocery store and I got my old man candy. There's Bitto Honey, Smarties, Tootsie Rolls, Butterscotch Discs, and some Werther's. I kid you not. They probably thought I was buying for my grandma, who's unfortunately no longer with us. But grandma, that, that's in your honor. Uh, for some reason, I just like to eat the old people candy. So Janice, thank you for the candy. I will be eating those Smarties and enjoying them. We got a couple of shout outs for you tonight. Logan, Lulu, Jill Schneider, Karen Lee, Johnny Scott. We have Glenn Jepson watching. Glenn, shout out to you. Thanks for watching. It was great seeing you and talking with you at CrimeCon last year. Jennifer Dixon's here. Angela Peterson. Deborah Willoughby, you sent stars apparently. Thank you for sending stars. How kind of you. Nicole Morris, Melissa Gray and Kristen Wolf. And I also want to mention Duty Ron. Duty Ron, thank you very much for supporting East Idaho News with a donation and Shanna Gray for sending your donation too. We, we truly appreciate it. All of that goes directly into our newsroom and helps us, helps it so that I can travel and bring you the news. Okay, questions. Ethan, why on earth is Chad allowed to have a laptop? I've gotten a lot of you emailing me this about why can he have a laptop. He was given a laptop in jail to review the evidence, to prepare for trial. I was told it does not connect to the internet. He's been using it at the trial. It is in front of him. Um, he scrolls through it. When they were doing jury selection, the jury questionnaires were loaded on his computer and he scrolled through those. So he does have that. Another question, and, and he is allowed to have it. It's not like he's cruising the internet though. But if for some reason he gets internet and he's watching tonight, Chad, come on the show. We'd love to talk to you. Um, also, the he's not handcuffed and he does not have on um, ankle bracelet, uh, ankle shackles, but he d appears to be wearing an ankle monitor. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over that one. Okay, someone asked, Lauren, I saw your recap last night. It was floored about the Emma Chad video. Can you please FOIA those telemate calls with Emma and Lori? If you don't know what a FOIA is, it's a Freedom of Information Act request or public records request. I have tried to request jail communication before with inmates. In Idaho, it is privileged. It's confidential. We can't get it. The only way we would be able to get it is if, it's, if it is admitted into evidence in the trial, and then we could. But jail inmate communication is not accessible to the media or the public. Someone said during the defense cross exam yesterday of Lieutenant Powell regarding Tammy's body, Pryor asked questions of the witnesses that disclosed Tammy's parents' medical conditions without their permission. Doing this may have violated HIPAA. Do you believe this is problematic? Well, HIPAA applies to health uh, and health facilities, hospitals, doctor's offices, doctor's nurses, like I could not violate HIPAA because I don't work for a, a health company. But if you're a doctor and you gave me medical information, you could get in trouble for HIPAA. We've had people tip us off as reporters and given us their health, health records of others. And we're not in trouble, but, but the people that gave them are. Because Tammy's medical records were subpoenaed, I, I, it was admitted into court I don't think he's going to get in trouble for revealing Tammy's parents' health things. Um, and sadly, now all the world knows if they wanted to keep that private. Jane wonders if we've noticed less attendance at Chad's trial compared to Lori's and less media attention. You know, I thought that might be the case. And I think there is a little less, not a lot less. They've they've shut down kind of half the courtroom. They're they're trying to not fill up the side where the jury is. So we're all having to sit on the other side because of some talkers. And so both sides are not full every day. So I think there are less people. There is still a line every morning. 
I, but but I think everyone that wants a ticket can get a ticket. I say that to you now, and now 12,000 of you will try to show up this week. Don't do that. Still go on and reserve your ticket. But I don't think it's as much. Media attention, far less. Court TV is here every day. Um, we're here every day. But that's kind of, the local stations are kind of in and out, uh, the local newspapers. So, yeah, it, it just depends. Is there a way to find out if there are LDS members as jurors? No, they were not asked their religion, but I would imagine some of them are based on the fact that we're in Idaho and that the religion is prominent here. But they're not, they did not ask anyone their religion, and I'm sure you know, we might find out one day. Does Ch LDS believe in Church of the Firstborn as part of their belief? As I mentioned earlier, no, it, it would be an offshoot of that. Um, but apparently it is mentioned in the, the Doctrine and Covenants book of Scripture. Can Nate Eaton be called to testify? I hope not. <laughs> I, I have not been served a subpoena. Uh, I was served a subpoena by John Pryor a couple of years ago, and we immediately fought that, hired an attorney, and he quashed it. Um, so I will not be called to testify, and I would fight that if they did try to call me to testify. Uh, and by the way, if you testify, you can't watch or see any other witness testimony. And so I would not be a good candidate for that. And that reminds me, I need to clear up something. Last night, I said that um, how Chad Davell's children, someone asked if they would be allowed to watch some of the witness testimony and everything thus far. And I said, no, they wouldn't. But I was informed after that under the exclusionary rule, there are some people who are allowed to watch it the whole thing and they would fall under that and lindsey blake made that clear on the first day of the trial like kay woodcock she's able to be in the courtroom every single day even though she's going to be called to testify she's there as jj's representative the as a victim chad's children are victims because their mother died so as victims they have the right to observe as much of the testimony as they want they're excluded from the rule of not being able to participate so uh, it was mu much like when Samantha Gwillem came last year, uh, Tammy Daybell's sister. She was able to sit in the courtroom and watch. So I, was, I did misspeak last night. I want to correct that. Stephanie, why isn't Chad being charged as accessory to murder in Charles's case? We talked about that today in court. It's because they don't think they have enough evidence to convict him. What do you think? What did you think when you heard Chad tell Alex he would be over nine angels? I mean, I don't know. I That's part of the blessing we talked about. Um, I don't really know what to think about that, but I'll let you decide for yourself what you think. Nancy asks if Kay is in the courtroom. I thought she was there. If so, is she testifying? Yes, yeah, she is in the courtroom, and as far as we know, she's testifying. But they haven't released the witness list, so not 100% sure, but I, I can't imagine them doing this trial without her. Is Chad wearing a wedding ring? Barb asks. I don't believe so. I will take a closer look tomorrow, though. The way that they, again, have us seated this time, you, it's kind of hard to see some things, but watch the video feed and see if he ever holds up his hand. Citizen Kane, what was Chad's reaction when the blessing was played? Uh, well, I could only see the back of his face, but if you want to see his reaction, go on and watch it because we have video. Chad's reaction during the phone call to the funeral home, during the blessing, during everything else, is pretty much the same. He sits there. Often has his hands like this. Often's looking down. He'll look up at the screen. He'll look over at the jurors. There's not much of a reaction. It's very different than how Lori reacted to things. Gwen says, do they provide meals for the jurors? They do. And the staff at the courthouse. And from what I'm told, there's like, um, at least in Lori Vallow's trial, every day there was something different, but they went for like the same places. Like there was four restaurants that would cater or sorry, there were, restaurants would cater and then they'd bring in the food and you'd have like four options. So you always tried to get to the best option first, like grab the turkey sandwich or whatever. You don't get to choose what you get every day. I think that the jurors in Lori Vallow's case told me last year they requested pizza one day and um, they got pizza. And so that's, you know, how it was. And finally, is there any chance that Tammy and Lori were actually friends? I don't know if they actually were friends. I don't know if there's any indication that they ever met. Um, and it's, I don't know. Lori sure thinks that they were. So there we go. 
Thank you all so much for watching. Remember, you can follow us right there. Trial again tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. Please tune in. We'd love to have you here. We'll be back at 8, at 6.30 Mountain Time for Courtroom Insider. Again, you can follow me all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, and YouTube. Also, Meetin' the Eatons is on YouTube as well. We try to bring you the best comprehensive coverage we can every night without getting too into the weeds. I appreciate you being here. I am going to go get ready for bed. I hope you have a good night. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.